thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Steve Sinkula. I'm the CEO and co-founder of AgroSecure. And Pete Kaputska, who's an account executive with AgroSecure and the owner operator of Red Pill Organics will be providing uh, the majority of the content for this afternoon. Uh, before launching into it, I wanna thank everybody for joining us. I really appreciate you taking the time out of the afternoon to be here uh, and provide a few housekeeping notes. One, uh, the webinar is being recorded as you should have been notified as you enter the webinar. Uh, that means that um, we will circulate a copy or a link to uh, re the recording should you wanna go back and to listen to certain points later or you're not in a place where you can take the notes that you might wanna take. Additionally, we will have the opportunity to receive your questions uh, by the chat or the Q&A. And so I'll watch for those. And in lieu of answering questions as they come in, we'll just kind of keep a catalog of them and then open it up uh, for questions and answers afterwards. I know that we got some questions beforehand that Pete may address uh, if we don't address them directly in the presentation itself. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Pete to introduce himself and uh, take it away. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, my name is Pete Kapuska. I live in Fort Dodge, Iowa. Um, if you want to advance to the next slide, Steve, that'd be great. Yeah, so um, a little about myself. I uh, grew up on a farm, and uh, the picture on the left there is um, from 1985. Uh, so you can see that I haven't changed a bit in the... Uh, 36 or so years that I started farming to where I am today. Um, one thing I wanna hit on before we get started deep into my presentation is recognize the rest of the team at AgriSecure as we have Kim Henson from uh, the Nebraska territory for AgriSecure, Andy, Abby Edel from our Eastern area, Illinois and parts east of there. Uh, Ken Jenkins is with us from uh, North Central Iowa. Ken and I do a lot of working together. And our business manager and business development manager, Bryce Burlbeck, is also a part of our AgriSecure team. So what do I bring to the team? Um, I grew up on this farm in North Central Iowa. Uh, after my Iowa State and through my Iowa State uh, education, I did farm at home. Um, I did farm through the early 90s, got out of farming, and have worked in a number of different disciplines within uh, agribusiness that I think prepare me uniquely to be an asset to the AgriSecure organization and then to you as farmers. Uh, I've worked in the co-op world. So I've worked with high functional conventional farmers as technology products have come in and practices. Um, I was a certified crop advisor for 15 years. I've worked as a DSM uh, for a number of different seed companies, uh, both those that are heavy into technology with um, traits and chemistry and those that were kind of on the margins of those uh, traits and chemistries. I've worked in uh, the insurance industry for a startup company. Uh, I've worked for a um, couple of adjuvant nutritional companies along the way too. So I've been on a number of different farms and seen a lot of different farming practices and things that work and things that are common to functional farms at a high level and things to be careful of. You wanna to go to the next slide, Steve? So as I went through my farming retirement uh, career phase prior to retirement, as you can see from this graph, this is something that a lot of farmers face if they're farming only in the conventional world. This is a graph showing profitability, and that zero line is that profit or loss without any government payments. So as you look over that period of time from 1996 to 2018, you can see very few years has conventional farming been profitable without any government payments. And if you took that line backwards to the mid 80s, early 90s, you'd see that we had a little bit of a bump there in probably 94 and 95 in terms of profitability. But prior to that, we had that same sort of recurring pattern of three and four and five years where there just wasn't a lot of profitability and government payments were the only thing that kind of kept you afloat. So, it's important to understand that these cycles would most likely continue in the conventional world. So how do people make it in the conventional farming world? Next slide, please. So as I've worked with farmers throughout my career and looking back at my own farming experience, there's some things that I've taken away 
I think uniquely position myself and our company for working with people that are going into the organic uh, um, opportunities. And probably the big thing is that planning of having a system in place of knowing what you're gonna be doing, not just from one moment to the next or one crop year to the next, but having a long-term strategy and vision about what you're doing, why you're doing it, and what the end results that are measurable, that are measuring success and things that you wanna improve on. Um, it's extremely important to be able to execute your opportunity to make good decisions. Um, in conventional, there's maybe not a lot of uh, decisions to be made, but you've got to be ready to make decisions when they occur and then get those decisions done and execute them well. Um, I think in the conventional world, it can be kind of tough sometimes, although with the internet, it's become much easier to find a network of people. Uh, I know when I was farming uh, in the small town, um, it was just hard for me to connect with most of the larger farmers that were very successful and some of the older um, landowners and managers to learn from them. So having a network or a, a source of um, education that you can bounce ideas off of is important. And then keeping things simple. Um, I know we've got a lot of opportunity with the internet now, um, but even years ago, um, people were looking at ways to become profitable and they tended to make systems that were otherwise simple, more complex. And that didn't always pay off and it became a draw against the time and energy it takes to do the things that are the right things to do. So as we kind of get started in a conversation about organics, I want to be clear, what are organics? I mean, there's a, a fairly easy technical point of view. When you're talking about an organic production system, you're starting with a date of a last chemistry or non-approved process and going forward 36 months plus one day before you're able to sell something off of that acre of ground. You're also talking about documenting processes that are involved in that transitional period so that you're able to show a chain of custody of information from start to finish to an end user and eventually then to the government. Um, you also wanna um, look at the um, different agronomy that you're gonna be uh, taking part of as you go through in an organic system as it being different. So as you start to understand a little more about organics and how they're different from conventional, we're gonna hit on a few of these things in, in the right side of that column to help you maybe better understand some of the challenges within the organic sphere. I think this is probably one of the more important slides you're gonna to see today. And if you take nothing else away from this presentation, understand that this is both a, in some ways conventional, but then I'll show you later how this applies to organic farming. Um, we see a lot of people in our business that come to us about organics and they come to us for a certain approach because they understand maybe the economics of organics are, are profitable, um, at least initially when they hear about a higher market price. Or they look at the farm ground in a certain way and they're really um, believers in the agronomic approach that organics bring rather than what a maybe a conventional chemistry and fertilizer program would need. So we're gonna talk about how all these kind of mash together but I think the important thing to realize is that the three components here of economics and agronomics and the management to do both of those things or make decisions in both of those are changeable and expanding, but they all have to work together in order to have a successful operation. So when we start talking about acres, for example, in an organic system, how do we know what's the right amount? We have a lot of people that come to us and say, well, I've heard about this organic thing. Let me just put my toe in the water and we'll see how it goes. That's one approach. We've seen people do that and we tend to see different results in the, in the meantime then. Because there's certain equipment that they need, they're probably not able to get their optimal return on investment for their time and the equipment that they purchase. And then they really don't even understand with that equipment what the limits of that equipment are, whether they're too big or too small of row spacings, whether they need more horsepower, need more labor. And then unfortunately, one of the most common one is that third one. 
when they go through the process of doing things in an organic fashion, but capturing just the conventional margin, when they get to that organic year, it's like, ah, if only I'd have known, I would have done things differently and added the right amount of acres. But we also have people that come to us with grand ideas of taking the farm and just flipping it all into organic. And that can create some issues too. There again, getting that size and scale right to not just equipment, but understanding your dollars and cash management, because transition can be a difficult period of time. You're going to be doing things very differently from conventional farmers in terms of rotation and croppings and management, and you may not have the same flexibility or profitability that you would in a conventional system that first year or that second year. One of the other problems because of that is that if you're not doing transition well and you've overextended yourself, you can put yourself in a position where you're starting to make some bad decisions because there's only bad decisions left to be made. And certainly one of the things you wanna think about as you're going through a transition period is that important third year, that third crop. So if you're making decisions in that transition that are not good for that third crop and beyond, it can cause effects that not only hit that third crop, but really limit your opportunities going forward. So it's important to work with people that have a good understanding of what's the right amount, um, where we can sit down and look at your operation and understand some of the strengths and weaknesses within that, and then be able to put things in a, in a format where we're able to make decisions out of strength by understanding the numbers of your operation and working with you to manage all the risks that's involved as you transition from conventional through transition to certified organic status. Another way of looking at it is putting it into boxes where you can start to see that if you're starting at a small amount with too few acres, you're not gonna see a big economic impact versus putting in that right amount, which we tend to recommend at least looking at that 25 to 35% of target acres. I'll be honest, when I sit down and talk to a farmer, we typically put all the acres into the pool, but then we start looking at things like the wrong field or the wrong plan and start to disqualify acres. So we wanna eventually get to that manageable target, but I think we need to be fully informed about what the opportunities are and work through each field and find out what are its strengths and weaknesses how would it fit into the plan and strategy for that third year and beyond and make sure we get the right amount of acres going forward that maximize the amount of labor you have and, and what you've got for um, a system of support and what your crop rotation looks like. So I think one of the biggest things that I look at when I start talking to people is looking at that managing risk. And managing risk doesn't always mean minimizing, minimizing risk. It also means making the right opportunity decisions. But when we start looking at um, managing fields, and I saw this especially when I was in the seed business, most people have their favorite field. Maybe it's their home place. Maybe it's that farm they bought first and they've done everything perfect on it. They've gone ahead and pattern tiled it. They put fertility in place. They manage weeds to a higher level than that other field, whether it's a cash rented field or just a poor performing field. And then when I start talking to those people about, well, where should we start putting acres into this organic um, basket? They wanna start with those acres. And I would say that's really challenging to get the most out of your farming operation. If you're taking those acres that have the least yield potential and carry the most risk because maybe they're not drained well, well, that can reduce yield certainly, but it can also increase weed pressure. Maybe you've got a field that's got um, uh, a C and D slope. Those can be kind of hard to manage if we're doing a lot of tillage. So we want to look at that basket approach with all the fields and look at those opportunities to put organic acres on those best fields to get the best return on investment. I know of one farmer that I work with that started with this minimized approach to taking a CRP field, for example, that was a low risk for him to get started in. With CRP and, and some other acres, you can go right into organics. But he's also, in the conversation we've had since, looking at his high yield fields, and he's in an area where it's not common, but he does have irrigation. So now he looks at those fields with irrigation and says, look, if I can irrigate and produce higher value bushels and produce more of them, shouldn't I be putting organics there? 
And I think with all other things being equal and things we can manage together, he's thinking about it exactly the right way. So yeah, it becomes a balancing act when you think about what's the right idea. And for most farms on an individual basis, it comes down to the best answer I've ever heard any agronomist give to any farmer. It depends. There are so many individual factors that each farmer has when they start to make decisions. There's got to be more input involved in making sure that decision is right for your farm. Not every decision that works for somebody else, and I'd say more often than not, decisions that work for nobody else when it comes to organic don't always work on your farm. So you want to think about managing that risk component of not spending a lot of money, but then putting yourself in a position to have a, a smaller return versus putting that right amount of acres in that have the best yield potential and with the right amount of planning and investment. I think it's also important to get your team on board. And that can be for most farmers, their, their wife who may have contributions into the operation, maybe she's the main record keeper or she has other functions on the farm. Certainly bankers, it's important to, since they're the line of credit, have them fully informed as to where you're going with things. And certainly landowners and landlords that they're aware of what's going on in the farm, why things are happening, and why it's good for them, but also good for you. So we talked a little bit about managing risk, and I think probably one of the questions I get over and over again, and in looking at the participants who were coming in today's webinar, weed management was probably the number one question we get when we start talking about organic crops. I think the answer to weed management is, it depends. But I think probably one of the strongest places to start is with your crop rotation. As you can see here, we've laid out a seven year rotation of basically a corn, barley, alfalfa, alfalfa crop. And as you see, we're looking at rotating, if you looked at each of those uh, groups as a field, of going from one crop to another in a, in a standardized way. And then looking at that lower grid, you're able to see that we're not changing from year to year the amount of acres. So your equipment, your time, your management remains the same. To me, this would be the ideal way to look at managing a rotation within an organic system. And looking at those transition years, certainly that alfalfa plays into this sort of a rotation. So making sure you have the right rotation for the right fields with the right objectives and the right amount of equipment, those are things that get you on the path to success. I am not an insurance agent. Um, we do work with farmers who do use insurance products to manage risk on their farm. We do find a lot of really good local agents that understand how to manage risk within organic operations, but it's usually harder to find than someone who's good at managing risk in a conventional operation. So as we start thinking about that movement from a conventional operation in those transition years, you've got to have the right insurance tool that's available to manage risk. A lot of farmers have spent numbers of years building up their conventional APH so they get a higher level of insurance coverage guarantee. When you go to organics, you reset that to the county T yield. And then when you go into organics, you're resetting that as well to that organic T yield as well. And you can see that that T yield is significantly less than that conventional APH. So how does that fit into the risk management within an operation? How does that fit into deciding what a rotation is best? You know, you may transition with corn, but you can see you're covering fewer dollars there maybe the transition with alfalfa starts to make more sense, even if it involves a little more labor. And oh, by the way, with alfalfa, you can tend to smother out weeds. If you're transitioning with corn, you could have more issues with managing both your time, equipment, labor. And if you let some weeds come through, you're starting to jeopardize the production in that year three. So these are not hard and fast rules about never transition with corn, but it, these are things you need to start being aware of if you're thinking about, from a conventional point of view, I've got more familiarity with corn, corn may be what I wanna do in a transition year. Okay. 
and Pete, I, I just want to call it one other clear takeaway from this slide is that during transition to operation it is required to ensure each field using transition insurance plan. So that's something that's just a watch out. Uh, we've seen some farmers who weren't aware of that um, or um, didn't like it because of the uh, economics, but it is a requirement. Um, and there are some, as you can see, the risks that the guidelines are followed. There are certainly some risks to, to not following the appropriate gui guidelines for ensuring your crops during transition. Yep, that is correct. And since both the USDA, who administers crop insurance, and organics are under the Department of Agriculture, uh, yeah, it's important to have both of those things put together in the right fashion. So, you know, just looking at what Steve was talking about in, in managing things from a risk point of view and making sure that you're in compliance with the program, there's other things to think about when you're going through that transition and then in those into those organic years. What's the best way to manage risk on your farm? Well, for a lot of people, they're comfortable maybe using a revenue policy where they're taking a APH, uh, building it up and ensuring a certain percentage of that, which gives them a dollar amount of coverage. We have seen where uh, there's whole farm policies, especially as you diversify into other crops other than corn and soybeans and crops that have a normal insurance component, that may be a better risk managing tool on your farm. So even within that example of looking at how to manage risk and, and um, put yourself in a good position, understanding how to build that APH if you're doing corn and soybeans, um, how to work with um, enterprise units or your revenue policies with your agent. Um, at the end of the day, like I mentioned, we're not insurance experts. We know people who are, and we know that this is an area where either farmers leave a lot of money on the table or they get overexposed in a risk point of view. So it's really important to be honed in on this as an important distinction between conventional farming and organic farming when it comes to overall profitability by managing risk. So as we kind of started, we talked a little about conventional farming. As you look at this diagram, you can kind of see that for most conventional farmers, this is their management wheel, so to speak. They look at what things they control and with traits and technology and other factors, their big decisions tend to revolve around their date they plant or fertility and how to manage it. Or the other side of it is how they sell. So there's not a lot of management opportunities to either improve or not do as well. So you're kind of locked in as there's not a lot of difference between the best farmers out there and the not best farmers out there. But as we've talked already about organics, you can see there's a lot more things to think about, a lot more opportunities to manage information to your benefit or to your detriment, depending upon how well you can manage things. And that's why we talked, or I talked earlier about answering a lot of questions and starting with, well, it depends, because there's so many of these components that are individual to each farming operation and how each farmer then processes risk and how they wanna manage their operation going forward. This is a great commercial that we've seen probably a lot the last couple of years. As you start thinking about what it means to be successful in organic operations, it may be a financial component that makes you feel that you're doing okay. It may be just that pride of uh, how your field looks compared to other things. But what we find when we talk and work with a number of farmers, most likely like yourself, okay is just not okay. You wanna have more opportunities to do things at a higher level and more professionally than some people are doing out there today. And for me, this comes back then to the gears. And we've talked a little bit of how these gears interact with each individual's farming operation and how they go about their business. Um, we've looked a little at the agronomics of how to manage different tools, uh, how to look at acres, how to look at insurance, uh, how to look at some of the risk. Um, a lot of people are aware there's organic um, pricing out there that's favorable if you can manage it. And that's the thing about it. How do we manage at that higher level in this environment where organics can be very difficult to manage successfully? 
So in all the people that we work with, there comes a point where people start to make a decision about what they want to do next. And we've seen a number of farmers that we work with um, decide, we're just, thanks for the information, we're just going to go ahead and go it alone. Um, after all, it is farming. It's my farm. I can farm conventionally very well. How difficult could be in organics? And unfortunately, we find out after following up with these people, it is really difficult. As a matter of fact, our founding partners were in the same boat. They started as conventional farmers, saw the opportunity, and tried to do what they could in best management practices to have a successful operation. Along the way, though, they'll be the first to tell you they've had failures. That's not uncommon. And it's cost them a lot of money and a lot of frustration. And unfortunately, probably the biggest thing, it cost them time. Uh, time is the one thing that none of us can create more of. So we do see people that go on their own. We do see people that tell us they're going to transition on their own. And then a year later, when we check back with them, say, well, we started, but we, we gave up because of this or because of that. Um, it's very difficult, especially if you're the only one in a community uh, geographically that's doing organics. So if option one is not what you're up for, option two is probably a better way to go. And that's to hire the best people with a proven system of helping farmers go from conventional farming to certified organic farming. And with the help of the team at AgriSecure, make you a master organic farmer in your area. We work with a number of farmers like yourself that came to us with a number of different skill sets. Some of them were really great managers in the conventional world. Some of them were not as good, but I think we've helped them all realize better performance just by sharing that information and giving them the right kind of tools to make those better decisions. To me, and I farm organically um, four hours away, um, it's not the most ideal opportunity, but I wanted to get back into farming. I certainly don't think I could have done it without the My Farm platform. All that information that we've talked about, all those management opportunities we've talked about, within the My Farm platform of grabbing information, putting that uh, plan together, executing and tracking that plan, and then taking a look at how we did, comparing a budget to an actual looking at all that information, certainly for certification, but then also looking at it from a financial managing opportunity and then a financial planning tool, the My Farm platform allows you the information in a format that's easy to gather and then easy to disseminate the information out of to make actionable decisions. I think of all the farming operations that I see that are trying to operate out of a shoebox or a spreadsheet, and they meet, meet the minimum standard of having that information available for a spot inspection, for certification, but do they have information from their own farm that's actionable that they can actually make decisions on? And to me, that's easier for me to sleep at night knowing that I've got that tool helping me manage that information. And so as we kind of start to wrap things up, I talked earlier about our team and I think the, the people we have in the field and in our management um, chain of command have certain strengths that we leverage and we converse back and forth to help everybody understand opportunities better, even at the, the farmer level. But we really hone in on being that person or that group that can help you make better decisions when it comes to understanding how the organic system works together. Certainly a lot of farmers, uh, I guess farmers by nature are not really good with paperwork. So the certification is one of those places where it can get very mysterious, very difficult to navigate without a team behind you to keep you on track and keep that information flowing to the certification company to make certification as smooth as possible. You certainly wanna have that plan in place and the ability to execute it in a timely fashion and track. And if we, are doing all that, but we don't have an idea of what we have for an opportunity to market organic crops in our area, our system is gonna fall apart. So we're able to bring high level understanding of what's available in your area. And then we do have options for that individual personalized service when it comes to marketing your organic crop. So as we kind of start to wrap things up a little bit, 
what we've talked about in organics um, may or may not be what you're looking to do. Um, I will say this, and I mentioned it earlier, time is the big enemy that you can't replace. So if you are interested in pursuing that next step, having a deeper conversation on your time with your farming information, starting sooner is certainly better than starting later. There's a lot of things that are going on right now in the field that we can start to take advantage of, whether it's looking at where you're at with your crop rotation and plans, understanding where weed pressure and how to manage that going forward. Equipment is certainly part of the puzzle for most farmers because they probably don't have the basic, a rotary hoe, a cultivator, um, a drag or a, a weed tiner if that's something they need. And then looking at their inputs in terms of fertility and making sure there's no problems there. And I'd throw drainage and pH correction in there too. And then starting that information gathering and getting it on that path to make certification as easy as possible, along with starting to identify some of those markets. And I'd say markets, especially beyond corn and soybeans. Um, there's a level of transparency, although not near what a conventional farmer has, as far as price discovery in corn and beans. But as you look at rotations and building out with crops that are not corn and beans, you want to have a strategy and a marketing plan in place. Um, certainly alfalfa is one that is tend to be a relationship with end users is built over years and being able to provide uh, a certain amount of bales or tons per year does help you market that part of your organic operation much better. So with that, uh, Pete, thank you very much. I want to do two things. One, I, I want to offer everybody who's attended today uh, a special promotion we have for those on the webinar. You can receive $500 off uh, the AgriSecure fee. Um, I know who you are because you've all uh, registered. So, and then with that would give you an additional bonus of three month, a three month subscription to our organic grain marketing newsletter to give you a feel for what the organic grain marketing uh, program is like. Um, although, um, so that's an offer out there for you. Feel free to reach out to us and let us know. We'd love to have a conversation or set up a conversation with the appropriate account executive in your area. So a special bonus for everybody who came today. Hopefully uh, you'll all consider taking advantage of that opportunity. Uh, with that, I wanna open it up to question, questions. And we got a few uh, from Jeff. Thank you, Jeff, for the questions. Uh, Pete, I'll give you the first shot at answering them. Um, I'll read them out to the group so everyone can see them. Um, the first was, why profitable in a brief period without government payments? Uh, so, yeah, and, and I'm not sure if Jeff is alluding to the conventional market and why, we were pro why there's profitability sh for short periods of time in the conventional market or uh, if he was speaking to the organic side of the business. So Pete, I'll let you interpret and answer the best of your ability. Yeah, I think there's a couple interesting things uh, in that question. Um, to start with, when you think about just supply and demand, um, that tends to be one of the big movers in the conventional corn market. And as we see profitability, uh, we see acre shift to meet that market demand at a higher price, then we flood the market with um, higher priced bushels, which reduces the price. And we do this all in a very efficient way that adds more bushels to the pile as we go. So we do see that cycle approach in conventional farming, where we see those few periods of profitability without government payments. And then with government payments, they tend to subsidize production at that lower rate, rather than allowing that economics to work through the market until we have weather events or a disruption somewhere that causes a shock to the system and brings us back to a profitability area. Now, I would contrast that with the organic structure. In organics, it's very much an end user driven market. Um, especially with COVID, we've seen an uptick in consumer demand for organic products because they're perceived as being healthier. We also produce a lot of grain here, but we don't produce a lot of organic grain. Currently, we import about 15 to 20% of the organic corn and about 70% of the organic soybeans. So you start putting these things together, we've got a strong demand, so strong that we're not producing enough bushels to meet demand, 
and we're bringing product in from overseas. And with COVID and with this economic inflation that we're going through, we're starting to see some hiccups in the system of supply management. So we are seeing issues with supply arriving when it's needed at certain spots. So we see more profitability within that organic um, um, you know, um, system, I think especially over time, but compared to the organic or conventional system. And, and I think that maybe leads into that next question of looking at that cost of production in an organic system versus a non-organic system. So on the, on the demand and the output side, we've established that the demand-driven market for organics tends to produce a higher bushel price or, or pound price based on the demand of the end user, where a conventional tends to treat it as a commodity interchangeable with other things. So looking at that cost of production, because the difference between those two will answer that profitability question. So as you think about organics, what I find anyway is that there's major components that are very similar. I mean, you're still gonna have the preparation of the soil, whether it's organic or conventional, be relatively the same, unless you're no-till, and I'll throw that in there. Harvesting is gonna be the same, whether you're talking conventional or organic. The things in between, planting is gonna be similar in that planting does occur in both systems. The seed cost is gonna be different, depending upon which direction you're able to go or go. An organic seed variety is going to be a little higher than a conventional, and a conventional does have a fit within a transition and to some degree an organic structure versus a traded product that you'll most likely want in a conventional system to manage risk because you've got a lot more dollars leveraged. In terms of that fertility package, you're looking at a replacement of sorts in that from a commercial point of view, you're putting on a certain replacement ration based on crop removal or whether you're going to build fertility into the soil for phosphorus, potash, and maybe some other things. In the organic system, you're looking at that um, fertility puzzle in a similar way, but you're using the analysis from that manure to build a ration that meets the need of that crop and understanding that there's some other factors as far as solubility and plant availability in an uh, organic system because you're using manure that's not there or that may be advantage because it's not there versus a conventional system. And by that, I mean, especially if you're thinking about nitrogen and corn, in a dry year, we see very little difference in the nitrogen that you applied in the spring and the nitrogen that's available to that plant throughout the growing season. But let's flip it around to a wet year. In a wet year, you're typically going to leach that nitrogen that's not going to become plant available in the commercial scenario of using a commercial anhydrous or 32% or urea program. If you look at that organic manure, because most of that manure is most likely in a mineralized state, that is, microbes in the soil need to break that down in order to release it, then it doesn't leach the same way. And if you're raising corn, having nitrogen available later in that season is beneficial because that's the big uptake when corn is taking in the most nitrogen in that pollination, uh, kernel fill, and then finally to harvest uh, time frame. So overall, in looking at a cost of production, there's going to be a little more hassle factor. There's going to be maybe a little equipment overhead by having a cultivator or a rotary hoe uh, to get started with, maybe on a tine weeder. Um, but those are older pieces of equipment that are typically you can find at auctions for relatively low amounts of dollars, at least to get started. Yeah, to summarize, uh, I think, Pete, uh, the question to the, the question, I think we see the, the cost of organic production being marginally higher. Um, as you're swapping out a lot of things, you're not using any of the chemical and those sorts of things. But uh, certainly the revenue generated far outpaces uh, kind of the, the very incremental cost of production on the organic side. Um, and then as you look at other opportunities to incorporate cover crops or your rotation, that's where you can really supplement a lot of the fertility needs that um, you may have because you're getting into a more robust crop rotation. So the next question was organic tea yields, are they based upon real data and, uh, or are they just a formula um, that's, that's used 
And so, Pete, I will let you take a shot at answering that because organic tea yields are not my area of expertise. Yep. Well, or, or transition tea yields for that matter. Right. Yep. But, and, and think of them in a similar fashion. Um, both are going to be reset from what your conventional tea yields are. Um, if you think about where your conventional tea yields start, if you take over a, a different farm than one you've ever farmed, you go back to that tea yield that's assigned by the county. Uh, for your county, and that's assigned by the RMA, the Risk Management Association. That's part of the crop insurance hierarchy within the USDA and Department of Agriculture. So the organic tea yields, you are correct, they're really not based on um, data, although they can be. If you've got organic farmers that are in your county that are um, producing and, and then posting those yields with crop insurance, you can see organic tea yields in your county be higher than a county next to you where they may not have as many or any organic farmers. But it is formulaic. Um, I guess the, the bigger thing is when you talk about what is real data, um, it's the same real data that would assign a conventional farming operation, a starting tea yield on a farm versus an organic one. Now, maybe what you're getting at though is with organic yields or my organic yields going to be at that lower level because my um, conventional APH is higher at uh, the T yield start than my organic T yield. And I'd say that we tell farmers as they start into the organic process that there is a learning curve. Um, I think in some ways it's difficult for a conventional farmer to go from conventional farming to organic. And it's probably easier to bring somebody outside of farming and teach them how to become good organic farmers because they don't come in with the same biases that conventional farmers do. So when you think about that, we do tell farmers that it's likely there's going to be a transition period for your yields as well. It could be, it could not be. It's based on those fertility factors and especially weed control factors. If you think about it though, in a conventional farming system, that grain that you're putting in the ground of corn, for example, has bushel potential of 700, 800 bushel an acre. And yet we're only capturing a couple hundred and we seem pretty satisfied with it. Well, those same genetics are available in the conventional world too. So from a genetics point of view, it's a push. You've got the yield potential in a conventional, the same as you would in an organic. Fertility, I already mentioned how you can address fertility by managing at that analysis level, replacing a conventional analysis with an analysis based on the manure and making sure your tons or pounds give you that desired analysis. So fertility in a lot of ways can become a push as well from a performance point of view. So what we typically see is that that management component, especially when it comes to weed control, tends to separate things out. Um, there's certainly things that are manageable, but by management, I mean, there's opportunity to have good things happen. But there's opportunity to have bad things happen. For example, this year we had a really nice period when I planted corn of almost two and a half weeks without any rain. Now to most farmers, that's not a good thing. In organics, it allowed me to dry out that surface and with tillage over that uh, 10 day, two week, three week period then, I was able to keep weeds from starting and that corn plant because I planted down into moisture was able to start shading and competing at a higher level than weeds could. And weeds just never really came and were a problem on that field. Now, if you reverse that and run into a situation where it's wetter than normal or your window of planting is in the right window, then you can start to see some slippage in yield potential based on the timeliness of weeding and managing things. So to be honest, my organic field that I farmed this year in Wisconsin, I expect it to be significantly better than a number of the conventional fields in the area, primarily because they had a cold weather event the 28th and 29th of May that really did a number on their corn crop. I didn't have mine in the field yet. It was still in the bag. So all things being equal, you know, there's opportunities to have higher or at least as good of yields in conventional. But the biggest thing is your break evens tend to be lower because your market price is higher. So chasing yields in organic is kind of a fun thing to think about but you don't take yield to the bank, you take dollars to the bank. So for me, helping farmers start to break that reliance on puffing their chest out about yield and start thinking about, well, what's the most profitable? And then what's the most profitable over a 10 year period? 
of managing them that rotation. To me, once we start to get to that side of the conversation, now we're starting to really show the impact of what organic farming can mean within an operation. And I'd add to that, Pete, you're, you know, our expectation and the reality that we've seen with our members is that their yields will certainly exceed the T yields that they receive. And that's why it's so important coming back to thinking about the rotation. How do you have a rotation uh, in your fields and your farm that helps build up your APH in organics as quickly as possible? So if you're going to be growing corn, how do you make sure that you have corn in a field that will contribute to your APH every year uh, so that you're building that APH history up and then you will be at a competitive advantage relative to other farmers who haven't entered into organic or maybe thinking about entering into organic because you already have that risk management base that'll be stronger than other, others coming into the market. And that's one of the reasons why when we talk with growers that are thinking about it, uh, and thinking about starting transition, we often urge them to start now because based building up that APH history, the experience uh, and learning how to be an organic farmer is going to set that base and put you at a competitive advantage should others enter into the marketplace uh, in the future. One, one thing I would add to that too, Steve, is that when we talk about that risk management, we talk about T yields, we're, we're not completing the picture unless we also talk about that revenue dollar coverage per bushel. Mm -hmm. When you get a lower T yield, typically in counties where you're going from transition, transition, you're still using your conventional yield. But when you get to that organic year, now you're using the organic market prices derived by the government. So this last year, that market price was over $9.50 a bushel in organic corn. So even if you're starting that third year of production with organic corn, and let's just say your T yield is $100. 100 you, bushels. 100 bushels. You took that, um, say $9, um, take 85% of that, and then multiply it by 100 bushels, you're probably going to the field with more revenue coverage than what you would in a conventional market. Not to mention the fact that when you sell those bushels in the fall and exceed those lower T yields, you're putting those dollars back into your pocket. And that's more likely to happen in an organic scenario than it is in a conventional scenario. So with that, I, I want to open it up to other questions from the audience. I know that uh, we covered a number of the key topics that we think are areas that folks really thinking about getting, go, thinking about getting into transition or actually starting transition uh, really need to consider to get off on the right foot and set themselves up for success in organic. But any other questions? Again, you can enter them into the chat or to the Q&A box. Pete, were there other questions that had been entered in advance uh, that you wanted to address or that you yeah. think? Yeah, just to kind of hit on a few other things. Certainly I mentioned that weed management and, and weed management is a big part of organics, but weed management was a big part of what people were asking. Um, I, I really think it comes down to, as we've talked about rotation as being important to manage weeds. You wanna keep the weeds off balance by harvesting that field or cutting that plant off before it can set viable seed for the next year. And things like alfalfa or small grains certainly do that. Cover crops can be a big part of that too. Um, but when you are in an in-season management situation, um, especially when it comes to the row crops, it's being on time and being aggressive with your tillage to the point of doing damage. Um, a lot of people have not had a lot of experience cultivating recently or rotary hoeing or dragging a field. And it can be kind of difficult the first time to go through and aggressively tear into that surface. And you might actually tear out a few plants. That's why we typically recommend that you plant at a higher population and that you do your tillage to the point of starting to remove some of those plants. Um, at the end of the day, I know on my own farm, there were parts of my field that I rotary hoed four times within a 24 hour period. That's a lot of stress on those individual plants. But looking at that area of the field or those areas of the field where I did that, 
within a week when I came back to that field, I was happy that I did. I mean, it was, you couldn't see hardly any damage and I don't expect to see anything at harvest either. But I also know that I've got better weed control in those areas because I did that. And that's one of the things I think I see when I talk to people, they're not as aggressive, they're not as on time as they need to be. Um, it's gotta be a priority thing. I think that's one of the reasons why I was able to pick up that farm in Wisconsin is that people over there are focused in on alfalfa and dairy. And so when it's time to cut alfalfa, they cut alfalfa. But that's the time you need to be out in that organic field and doing processes that limit and eliminate weeds. It can't be done after and hope you get caught up after that next rain because you'll, you'll never be there. So that weed management part of things, um, keeping it down and looking at the long-term benefit of doing that, being in a sustainable system, or if you don't, you're gonna have to exit organic and manage weeds conventionally because we see people go into the death spiral where they're losing yield and then they try to put a higher value crop out there or corn or soybeans because they're not getting as much yield, but they'll get dollar return by a higher bushel price. But then they keep that canopy open, get more weed seed. And before you know it, it's, it's a totally unprofitable farm and they either walk away or have to go into alfalfa on purpose for a long period of time to beat the weeds back down. So it's just better to have that plan and strategy in place of your rotation, being in sync with your timing and tillage and your expectations over that 10 year period of what cropping systems I'm going to be doing. That, 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 that's certainly true and resonates with a lot of the core principles at, at AgriSecure. We really try to help our, our members uh, execute on in their farm operations. And I know adding into that, uh, there's a lot of attention that uh, in organics around flamers and weed zappers and some new tools that are coming out to help with weed management. And they certainly have a place, uh, but with, with members getting into organics, oftentimes we, we do exactly what, what Pete mentioned is we kind of stick to the basics, right? So first let's make sure you have the right field rotation. That's gonna give you the opportunity to stay ahead of weeds and manage the weed issues. Let's make sure you have the right rotation on your farm. And that rotation on your farm, if you think back to that example that we went through where it was balanced and had crops that were, had different activities at different times so that you have enough execution capacity to be timely as peat managed. And then let's make sure that you have the basic tools. And that often starts with a cultivator and a rotary hoe and maybe one other implement. And let's see how that works first. And then from there, depending on the crops that you want to add into your rotation or the challenges that you're having on your farm, we can look at and see if there are other implements out there that can be valuable and where you're really going to get that return on your investment. Uh, for example, uh, one of our founders, Bryce Robeck, who Pete mentioned early on, had bought a flamer and found for his rotation that he didn't really need to use it. Uh, and so he ended up selling that piece of equipment. Um, so that's where some of the, the things that are, uh, you know, kind of get you excited because they, you can see how they destroy weeds and you get to excited by the BTUs they can throw off may not be a natural fit. So starting with the foundation, building the right foundation, then adding on as you expand your operation is often the place that, uh, or the strategy we think is most appropriate. Steve, I think one of the questions I saw in the, uh, the question submitted prior was regarding landowners and landlords and how to approach or how to work with people in organics. I think in, it's probably one of the more difficult subjects to talk about because there's so many factors that come into a tenant and landlord relationship. Um, certainly not every tenant, not every farmer is an organic farmer. And that's probably true of, of uh, landowners as well. Um, but I think it's important if you are seriously looking at an opportunity to work with organics and you're looking at a land uh, piece that has an owner involved in the landlord situation, that you preemptively or openly talk about what you're going to be doing and why you're going to be doing it. And from my perspective, why it's beneficial for a landowner to have an organic tenant. Um, I think organic tenants tend to be more engaged. I talked to a, a couple of landowners as I'm trying to expand my operation, and they talked about some of the failures they've had with previous tenants. And one of them is that while they cash rented the ground, that's all they ever did. They, they never saw them, they never did anything else. 
Um, they came, they paid their bill and they left. And, and that landowner really wanted someone to nurture or take care of that farm. Um, and they were feeling a little slighted, even though they were well compensated for that. And I think in the organic world, as you start to talk and show them the value of having a rotation and how it doesn't deplete the soil and how it may enhance, and I think does enhance, the biology of a soil and make that a longer term value investment for a landowner to have a piece of ground that's more valuable versus something that's had commercial synthetic fertilizers and chemicals. Um, they're Having been on both of those uh, farms and, and really spending a majority of my years in the conventional world, I am amazed when I walk onto farms that have been organic uh, for any period of time that there is a different feel to walking across that dirt. Um, I know for myself, one of the things I noticed on my farm that's had been organic for a number of years is that the previous residue from the year broke down so much more quickly than what I was seeing in other fields in that area. And that's because there is more biology in that field. Now, does that mean anything? Well, those are all soluble nutrients that are available. Those allow fields to warm up and dry out quicker. And in the spring, that can be very beneficial. So if you're working with the landowner, I think there's certainly some benefits that you can point to of preserving their asset and putting them in a position to have a long-term relation with a tenant rather than a long-term transaction with the tenant. I think that's really well said, Pete. And I think that's been the key for many of our members as they went out and established new relationships or built on relationships that they had with uh, landowners for which they work with. Any final question that you want to address, Pete? Nope. I think the biggest thing, though, is um, like I mentioned, if, if our presentation today and things that you've heard have piqued your interest, then preemptively feel free to follow up with any of the AgriSecure team members. Um, go to our website, contact us through the, uh, the contact information here on the screen. We're happy to continue the conversation and make it personal to you and show you what organics can do in your farming operation.